So I've been playing some more with the 16 gigabyte M1 Mac mini, and I thought it would be useful to do just a quick update video. I'm not gonna go into serious detail in this video, but there is a few more things I'd like to share with you guys. So a few people have mentioned having Bluetooth issues with these Macs, and I've only been using a standard Apple keyboard and trackpad up to this point. So I connected up my trusty Sony headphones and I spent a whole morning listening to music and I found the performance to be completely solid. There was just one very tiny glitch which occurred when macOS was asking me for admin approval on something. And what it does at that point is connects to my Apple Watch. So on the Apple Watch, you can double click the watch button instead of entering the password on your Mac. And obviously it does that process over Bluetooth and the music in my headphones stuttered for maybe a second, but that was it. Now the M1 Mac Mini supports the Bluetooth 5 standard, which incorporates low energy mode for audio devices like headphones by default. But my guess is that this is also what the keyboard and the trackpad use because uh, most of the people who are having problems are using non-Apple Bluetooth peripherals. I do have a Logitech mouse, so I'll do some more testing on that and report back. Uh, next, I want to show you some DaVinci Resolve performance in version 17. Uh, this is a public beta, and as I was testing it, actually, I got notified of a new release. So I've downloaded that, and I'll do some testing with that as well in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to see how the machine copes with a couple of different types of video. Now, naturally, Apple Silicon is very well optimized for H.264 with 8-bit color. Uh, this is the most common type of video file that you'll get off of consumer cameras. But what I wanted to test was some Blackmagic RAW and also some 10-bit HEVC footage. Now, a viewer of the channel, Graham Laws, thank you, Graham, sent me some very nicely shot H.265 10-bit clips that are in 4K at 50 frames per second. So I put those onto a 2160p timeline with 10-bit color depth. Playback, as you can see, is very smooth and it's comfortably hitting 50 frames per second. Applying a basic color grade makes no difference to that at all. So I also added a Gaussian blur. And once I did that, we start to see the limits. Playback in the timeline starts to stutter, although it still claims to be playing at 50 frames per second. Sometimes actually I have seen it playing this part of the clip without stuttering, but I didn't manage to capture that on camera. Uh, the final render performance is adequate. It runs just slightly slower than real time for this particular timeline. So this is just a brief test, but what do these things mean? Well, we know that Apple Silicon is well optimized for high efficiency modern video codecs, but if you wanna push it with 4K upwards resolutions and 10-bit color, it doesn't take much to find the limits. Now I'd say that any consumers or enthusiasts would be delighted with this performance, but I still maintain that this isn't an ideal platform for professionals just yet. Now naturally that is going to depend very much on the type of codecs and the video formats that you're working with. Uh, my regular editing machine is the 2013 Mac Pro, which has got no optimization whatsoever for H.265. So if I put this same footage into a Resolve Studio 16 timeline on the Mac Pro, uh, it only hits about 18 frames per second on playback. But I don't work with H.265, so that's not an issue for me. Now, I did also try some Blackmagic RAW with the 70 gigabyte 4K 3 to 1 clip that was shot at 25 FPS. Due to the limited storage on this M1 Mini, uh, I've only got the 256 gig internal SSD, so I decided to use my external NVMe drive over Thunderbolt. So I've done a quick speed test here to show that this is plenty fast enough to work with this kind of footage. And again, the M1 Mac Mini had no problems at all playing back the footage. And that's really nice to see because when I initially tried it on Resolve 16, when I first got this machine, it was pretty awful. And again, a color grade and a Gaussian blur don't make much difference to performance. But if I try to layer a second copy of the clip on top of it with the opacity turned down so it becomes see-through, then uh, that's enough to stop smooth playback in the timeline. In Activity Monitor, we can see that the GPU is maxed out. So clearly the B-RAW footage really likes GPU. And that's presumably why it works so well on my Mac Pro with the eGPU. So instead I dropped one of Graham's clips on top and it handled that just fine because of course it can then offload the H.265 processing to the custom chip that's on the silicon. So this is not an exhaustive test by any means, but I just wanted to show you my initial findings. 
The M1 Mac Mini is very impressive for video editing, but complex timelines will show up limitations and final render performance may not be the fastest. Now for me personally, I'm often working with B-RAW and also H.264 footage in the same timeline, and clearly that's a good combo for the M1 Mac Mini. You also need to bear in mind that we're dealing with 10-bit color here, and that's 1.07 billion colors compared to 8 bits, which is 16.7 uh, million. Uh, there's a huge difference and it requires a lot of processing power. If you are using 8-bit footage, well, I've done a few edits already in DaVinci Resolve 17 on this computer using 8-bit H.264 and it's been a seamless experience. Though again, I would say it's a little slower than I'm used to on the final render, but nothing drastic. Um, as always with video work, your mileage will vary because every project is different with different video formats, different codecs, different timeline resolutions, different outputs. Uh, so you can't just watch one video and assume that uh, this represents performance for everybody. You need to do your own testing. Also want to show you something else that I found runs really well on this M1 Mac Mini, and that is this Affinity Designer file that contains all of my podcast thumbnails. One of our designers in the studio prepared this for me using Affinity Designer, but I'm not familiar with that app, so I normally open the file using Affinity Photo, uh, as I'm doing here. And you'll notice the file has this halftone effect on the image of me and Pete, and this is a very large image, and there are lots of copies of it in the file, so it's quite a, a big file to load. And I'm loading it from a conventional spinning USB hard disk, but as you can see, it's really smooth. This file chokes on my MacBook Pro 13 inch. I have noticed that memory usage is quite high when using this app, and I've got some more thoughts on that, and also on the memory swapping behavior that is evident in these Macs. Uh, also, Pete today is doing some further testing on the eight gigabyte MacBook Air uh, to do with memory and swapping. So we'll do another update video with that later in the week. But in the meantime, I hope you found this particular video useful. Uh, please support the channel with just a click of that subscribe button and maybe share this video with someone else who you think might like the content. Hopefully I did enough to earn a thumbs up or a thumbs down if uh, that's how you're feeling. But in any case, see you next time for some more geekery.